I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, a global publication about digital transformation and sustainability. A warm welcome to all of you joining the panel on fast-tracking progress through data and AI. I encourage participants to post their questions to the chat. If time allows, I will pose your questions to the panelists. Our focus today is on how to best apply data and AI to the UN global goals. The potential benefits are well known, but there are a number of challenges to scaling the technologies. For starters, we know the impl implementation requires a significant amount of data, which often sits in different hands. And complementing, ma complicating matters even further, the data may be stored according to different protocols. Data analysis requires significant computational infrastructure, which can be cost prohibitive, as well as communication networks to access the infrastructure. The AI models used can be proprietary or expensive, as can the tools needed to build new ones. The countries that need to use AI for the SDGs or the organizations working on them may not have the skilled engineers to combine models, data, and infrastructure in an optimal way to produce an output. And even if they can, once an output or an insight is generated, it's only as good as the management or domain-specific plans the organization or government have to address a specific problem. So to summarize, there are five barriers to scale that need to be addressed when we apply data and AI, and these barriers are particularly acute in emerging economies. Data compatibility, meaning the ability to make enough siloed data accessible for model training, access to computing resources for the purpose of training AI models, access to top tier AI models or to the tools and libraries needed to build new ones, technical expertise and skills to integrate data, computing resources and tools and models to produce insight. And finally, the domain expertise and management capabilities to turn AI generated insight into climate action. The goal of this panel is to look at some concrete examples of how data and AI are successfully creating impact and share some of the lessons learned so that more organizations and more countries can overcome some of those barriers. I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists, Charlotte Petri Gornitska, Deputy Executive Director at UNICEF. Welcome, Charlotte. Paula Ingabirai, Honorable Minister of Information, Communications and Technology at Rwanda's Ministry of Information, Communications, Technology and Innovation. Ocean Data Technology Champion, Kimberly Lane Matheson, General Manager for Microsoft Norway, who will assume her new role as CEO of the Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean in the coming months. I'll begin by asking all of the panelists from their own experience and knowledge to share one or two examples of data and AI being leveraged effectively for the UN global goals, and then to identify which of the examples you mentioned um, you think will have the highest potential to um, glo scale globally. So let me start with you, Charlotte. Um, tell us what you think. Thank you. I will try to be as concrete as possible. Thank you, Jennifer. But first, uh, I agree with the five elements you mentioned as a framework, but UNICEF and I would be inclined to add a sixth on responsibility. Two years ago, in partnership with NYU's GovLab, UNICEF launched the Responsibility Data for Children initiative. And that partnership has a focus on field practitioners and it's all about guidance, tools and leadership to support the responsible handling of data for and about children. And I'll 
put in the chat box later where you can find out more about this. It's also important, secondly, to, to talk about the access to digital solutions, including those that leverage AI. And we know they are severely restricted for much of the world, especially for those who stand to benefit the most from these solutions. Of course, this is a driver for UNICEF. And we talk about the digital divide when we talk about AI, it's even more so. So we think that's very important. A colleague of mine in UNICEF says, UNICEF cannot rest until we know that the last adolescent girl with a disability in Northeast Nigeria has access to the services she needs. And what I appreciate most about this statement is it's, it doesn't only underline what the Sustainable Development Goals talks about a lot, meaning leaving no one behind, but it also accentuates the need for appropriate disaggregated data. And we need AI and machine learning to support this. And in terms of an example, Jennifer, you asked for examples. Last month, UNICEF launched the Children's Climate Risk Index. And this index uses data to generate new global evidence on how many children are currently, and, and we talk about that, but this is data, but how they are currently exposed to climate and environmental hazards, shocks and stress. And it shows that one billion children, nearly half of the world's children, live in a country at extremely high risk of the impacts of the climate crisis. We're talking about 33 countries and they, they just contribute 9% to the green gas emissions. So this is a very important data here. But let me, uh, I think that the, the index is important as such. It is bringing together uh, geographical data by analyzing exposure to climate and what I talked about hazards, shocks and stresses, but also in combination with child vulnerability. So this index helps to understand and measure the likelihood of climate and environmental shocks or stresses leading to erosion of the development, mainly for children and, and uh, vulnerable household groups. And I'm not excited about uh, the the kind of figures that we see in this index, but I am excited because the index uses data science analytical techniques that are kind of new in synergy with existing statistical data and analysis. So bringing together established and new ways of working can actually realize the benefits of both. And lastly, uh, what we do see, we, we talk about scale up, and of course we need to scale up solutions, but when we talk about data, we actually need to scale down or scale out because we, we need to know exactly what we need to do in North, Northeast Nigeria for the adolescent girl. And for this purpose, we need to be much more knowledgeable about that situation and we need dis disaggregated data. So thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. I, it's clear that uh, this index um, can have an impact because it actually measures the impact on the children. And hopefully that will be a catalyst for action. So let me turn now to you, Minister, um, and ask you um, to give us a few examples of um, how you see AI and data um, impacting the global goals. Thank you, Jennifer, and happy to be joining this panel with both Charlotte and Kimberly. And I'll be very quick because I am being mindful of time. Um, I'm going to share two examples, one of them being how um, Rwanda as a country has used uh, data and AI pre-COVID um, to respond to some of the you know, challenges that we were seeking to find solutions to as a country. And the example I'm sharing is of a local company uh, called Caris that was using drones um, to, um, to in the fight against uh, malaria. And what they were doing, we were using um, drones to capture aerial images 
and some of the marshlands uh, across the country and would use that data to develop an AI model that could quickly detect the mosquito uh, breeding hotspots. And this allowed us as a government to uh, quickly act on the information and intervene with more targeted widespread spraying uh, using these drones. And so not only were we uh, using area images to figure out these uh, mosquito breeding hotspots, uh, hot we're also using the same drones to then spray these marshlands uh, and, and prevent the spread um, of malaria. And I think this is a clear uh, model to your point that can be scalable, especially to most parts of the developing world, because we still have malaria that is prevalent in, 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 in most parts of uh, of Africa. The second example I'd like to share is a partnership that we had with the uh, GSMA uh, where, and this was during the COVID times, we were looking at the changes to public transport uh, capacity due to some of the preventive measures, the social distancing requirements that we had put in place. And as you can imagine, uh, um, the, 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 you know, the, the transport companies or transport operators, their revenues reduced significantly because they, their current capacity was at least at 50%. And on those good days, it would be around 75%. And so that led in a mismatch in both the demand uh, and supply um, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, the, of public transport. And so what we did was to look at some of the ticketing platforms that we had in place. Uh, and, and, and I think this is really a great example where we realized that um, uh, what has happened is that we've invested in tools that allow for bus ticketing, and so you're able to use this data, you're, use, you're able to use um, call data records as well uh, for citizens, and this led uh, to us being able to figure out uh, bus optimization, route optimization, which routes are mostly congested now that the, the, the supply for public transport has significantly reduced given the COVID-19 preventive measures that have been put in place. And more excitingly, what we're able to churn out is with this new, uh, we've embarked on a new agenda of um, you know, uh, advocating for e-mobility uh, and putting in place incentives to have the different e-mobility providers, whether it's for motorcycles or cars. And so this same data has enabled us to sort of like map out the different charging stations where they should be placed and in turn attract the private sector to, to place some of those. And so these are two concrete examples on how um, as a country, as a government, and together with the private sector, we've been able to leverage the power of data and, and use that to inform decisions, but also to build models that can then uh, you know, feed back into some of the interventions that we are undertaking. I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Minister. And what I love about your examples is, you know, first, it underscores the um, importance and um, potential effectiveness of public-private partnerships, but also that you're using AI and data not only to identify problems, but to actually take action. Um, uh, so, you know, great examples. Thank you so much. And now let me turn to you, Kimberly. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about how data and AI can help us save the oceans. Great, thank you so much for having me here. I love the examples given so far, three great ones. And, and, and in fact, I love that you start and ask us to get pretty specific on examples. So I'll get right to that, but let me just make the comment to say what, what we are in fact, <laughs> because to the five and six uh, challenges you just mentioned, we agree that getting data for our oceans or getting data for just about anything um, gathered together in the aggregate that we really, really need is extraordinarily difficult right now. And so that was the motivation, particularly around oceans, that World Economic Forum with the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the ACA Group and Microsoft came together in order to form the world's, ultimately the ambition would be to have the most important data collaboration platform, highways uniting all of the data we need in order to provide the insights to the world where they need it so that each and every nation each and every company, each and every organization doesn't have to go out and try to build that themselves. So that is exactly the nature of what we're trying to do in scaling it on a basis which has never been done before. Now to that end, we have imported, we've built a platform, we've imported an awful lot of important data already. And I'll give you a couple examples of how that's already working in pretty exciting ways. In the first instance, we, um, we need to promote a whole lot more shipping on our oceans and a whole lot more aqu aquaculture to take two examples. So food from the oceans in order to be able 
to paint a good word going forward, but we have to do it without destroying the oceans. So what we've done is look at shipping first. If I take those two examples, shipping first and say, we've combined data from an automated identification system. It's, it's fairly kind of partly open data today. It's a system that tracks 200,000 ships worldwide moving around. When we imported that data, compiled it together and fed it into a recognized model for, for what the emissions were likely to be, you know, ships across the world right now are largely not equipped with the sensors where we can easily pick up how much emissions are going out. Well, we can wait a long time for that to get fixed, or we can use AI and data that we already have available in order to model with a pretty good level of precision, 200,000 ships that are out there already today. And we've done exactly that. We've put that data out there and as we now start to bring that data to life, we get a whole lot of interested people in helping us to make that data even better so that that data actually, you know, interested parties, parties that are running those ships and those emissions, for example, really wanting to make sure that that data is accurate, that we do have transparency around it, right? This is to help compliance, but this is to also help ultimately catalyze a transition to cleaner fuels and be able to highlight where companies are taking responsibility and where that's going well and give credit where credit's due and usher in change faster. So it's a fantastic example. It, it's, it is a great example. And if I'm, if I'm um, correct, I think that um, the data shows that the emissions are actually going up. Um, and, um, and so if action isn't taken, things are, are, are gonna get a lot worse. So yeah. tracking this is super important. It is, you're right, it's super important. Do you want me to share one more example or do you, want to, do you need to move us along for time? Go ahead, give us your yeah. other example. Aquaculture is maybe you know, another interesting area to focus on um, where we see, for example, issues of lice on fish and issues of algae blooms. Um, we've seen terrible uh, losses of the, in the industry because of these issues in the aquaculture industry. So where we're raising salmon, for instance, in the oceans. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're gonna get um, proper learning out of what could prevent those conditions from happening? What could prevent that devastation of those crops of fish, right? Which is bad for the environment, bad for the economy, it's bad for everybody. We're finding out through collaboration that the industry themselves is, is very, very interested in forward leaning, that they're sharing data now in a way, partnering in the early stages now, but partnering with our ocean platform to get data onto the platform and get these different fields which are raising the fish collected together because each one has trouble demonstrating all of the causes and then acting on them. But when we aggregate that data across very many different places, across very many ocean ecosystems and many ecosystems across the planet, suddenly we can learn a lot more and we can do things that are good for everybody to remedy those conditions and spot them and get proactive about knowing much more to, to head them off, if you will, or to minimize the damage and then maximize the outputs from, from our endeavors. So another great example the world needs. Yes, I love the example of aggregating data because um, we, we will need cooperation um, between various entities to, to really um, fully um, leverage the power of AI and data for sure. So, um, you know, I'm conscious of the time, let's move into the second question about how can governments and organizations overcome the challenges um, related to data access and resources and infrastructure um, for training the big data, um, big machine learning models um, that we encounter across different climate use cases. Um, so again, I'll start with you, Charlotte. Thank you so much. I, I think what we can agree, all of us, is that uh, AI and data talent and breakthroughs today have very little to do with the most vulnerable and the SDGs. So we need to turn that around and partnering around, well, first of all, one of the things that uh, we've seen work in, in uh, partnerships before is when agencies, organizations like UNICEF and others who actually know a lot about the problem, share the problem with those who can really work with the solutions. And that has to happen. Uh, private sector thrives from problem solving. So we need, <laughs> we need to get uh, 
the people who are now perhaps in Silicon Valley by themselves and the UNICEFers, I'm sorry if I use UNICEF as an example, but just to be very concrete, we are there in our own uh, ecosystems. We need to get them together. We need to put the problem in the driver's seat. We really need to make sure that, that we invest critical mass also closer to the use cases uh, so that we can get the disaggregated reality as well as data. And then we need to share. Uh, there's a lot of data we don't share. So we need open source and transparency. So that's a few uh, examples from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Let me turn to you now, Minister, because I know uh, Rwanda is tackling some um, important issues through um, legislation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Thanks, Jennifer. And maybe I'll start off on something that Charlotte uh, pointed out, which is really sharing data. And that's one of the challenges when it comes to, uh, for many of uh, you know, the organizations that are leveraging uh, big data um, to even build their AI models where they lack access to data. So there's one um, um, aspect of, we don't have enough data or we don't even have the data that we're looking for. But there's also the other aspect of the quality of data, because if the quality of data is lacking, uh, obviously you can imagine what the output of the insights will look like. Um, and so I think that's the very uh, first challenge that is related to data access. And then the other one is having in place the right uh, governance instruments uh, to make sure that um, the data that is used is, is used in a responsible, trusted and secure manner. Uh, and so making sure that you have, you know, some of these instruments is also, a, you know, a key challenge that I see largely. And today we are working with our Center for uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is an affiliate center of the World Economic Forum, um, to address some of the governance gaps uh, in this area to unlock the potential of data. And uh, we, we are also looking through, under this uh, Center for AI Policy and Innovation, what we want to create is an, an, a national AI research cloud that can host high value um, open data, open government data sets for research purposes. And this, um, this is substantiated with other government interventions uh, related to availing data sets uh, that could be used to develop uh, AI use in public governance, as well as supporting the research community. Uh, and, and because of that, we also put in place about two years ago, we put in place an open data policy where we were encouraging most government institutions to really open up some of their data sets, uh, whether it's for innovators, but even as we think about building this uh, AI industry, knowing that it's banking heavily on the availability of quality, reliable and available data. And it was important that as a government, we even take a lead, we walk the talk in really also opening up some of the data sets because we happen to also um, Uh, to create relevant solutions. And as I uh, finally, my last point on this is we're putting in place an AI legislation um, which really uh, comes in to address uh, challenges around uh, access to data, around uh, how do we get the right skills uh, that are needed, the, the expertise that is needed to be able to analyze and synthesize and be able to provide um, uh, tangible insights, but also uh, really figuring out how do we attract some of the companies that are already building AI capabilities and solutions to come and consider Rwanda as a proof of concept uh, place where they can test and try some of their AI models and solutions. And if proven successful, we can then think about scaling them to other parts of the world that are grappling with the same challenges we're trying to address with these solutions. And I think these pieces put together are what will really um, allow us to have a thriving AI industry. Thank you so much for um, outlining that for us. And I, I think it's clear that, you know, you are laying the groundwork for Rwanda to become a test bed for um, all kinds of different um, uh, AI and data applications. Um, we're quickly running out of time, but Kimberly, I want to give you a chance to weigh in. Um, uh, can you just quickly tell us, like, you know, the one or two things that you feel are needed to overcome the barriers. Yeah, in the first instance, um, when we listen to the minister from Rwanda, that's done such an impressive job of really being an advocate for sharing data and, and, and very many great things. It also just reminds me that we don't want every nation out there building this themselves. So one thing that I think is extremely powerful, for example, the Norwegian government 
um, has spearheaded a high level panel for ocean sustainability, um, the Ernest Solberg government. 14 nations are a part of that already. And that important working group has decided to give the mandate to this center, to the center that I will become the CEO of, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Ocean, in order precisely not to have every country building an asset, a collaboration, an apparatus which uses AI, makes these insights readily available again and again and again out there. So that's a fantastic scaling mechanism for all of us to get to enormous uh, important value earlier. And I, in my last comment I wanna make is, we're gonna work really hard in our center as well to open up industry data much more broadly and much quicker than it's been opened up so far. And that's the uniqueness of what we want to bring to this as well, to literally um, create the determination and the compelling cases for industry to mix their data, open their data together with uh, government data, with research data, and be able to have that interplay happen in a way um, sooner than ever. I could talk more in the breakout time afterwards on the barriers to doing that. We're learning a lot so far. Um, but but that's a, that's an incredibly important activity, and, and you know we're on the case. It's going to set, be a central theme for us. Um, okay, fantastic. We are um, we are almost out of time. I want to thank um, our three panelists for giving us some really terrific concrete examples and and of of things that you've seen in the market, but also about how to overcome the barriers. And um, these, these um, will um, serve as a great uh, jump off point for further um, discussion.